Cool. I'm going to do it on my end too here. All right. looks like we're good to go. All right, guys, welcome back to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. This is your host, David Dodge. And today I am joined by Brett Schwartz. And Brett is from Capital Gains Tax Solutions. And he has his own podcast on this. So he is a pro. And today we're going to talk about some different solutions on how to protect yourself from paying those big capital gains. Brett, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing today? Mr. Dodge, better than I deserve. Thanks for having me on the show. Hey, I'm glad you're here, man. Okay, so let's start first start talk about let's first explain what a capital gain is, if you don't mind. Yeah, capital gain is when you buy something and you have a gain and you go to sell it. The difference between what you bought and sold it for is called a gain. So let's say you bought a property for a hundred thousand and you sold it for a million. It's a nine hundred thousand dollar gain. And that is taxable. The US government and your state, most states will tax you. And then you have a thing called Obamacare. Somewhere between 25 and 50% with the depreciation recapture is going to Uncle Sam or your state authorities. Man, that is no fun at all. Nobody likes that. Okay. So what do we do to prevent that or avoid it or reduce it or mitigate it or defer it? all the above, right? How do we avoid that? Or, you know, what solutions do we have? Yeah, there's a couple that you might know of. 1031 exchange is the most common one for the real estate investor, where we can you know, identify something in 45 days, close it within 180. If it's, you've owned it for more than one year, you can also buy assets and do what's called cost segregation or depreciate an asset. Mostly multifamilies, 27 and a half years are some of the best, a residential commercials, 39 years, and you can maybe get some offset there. Um, but beyond that, most people, and we call those the blockbuster methods, and they're very well known. And you remember blockbuster video, David, showing up on a Friday night, and you're getting that movie, and it's behind that cardboard box, and you're excited to get it, and you're on a mission to get it, and then you somebody steps in front of you and grabs that movie, and you're like, shoot, I wish I would have been here 10 seconds earlier. Isn't, mm -hmm. Why isn't there a way for me to rent something out? Well, that's kind of like a blockbuster 1031. You've got 45 days to uh, get engaged, 180 days to get married, to shotgun wedding sometimes, or even if it's short term for some of your clients that are doing the Burr method where they're fixing and flipping, unless, unless they're dealers, if they're just doing few that are less than dealers, we can use the deferred sales trust as an alternative. And this is where we, we call this the Netflix way of exit planning. Instead of using a 1031 exchange, you can exit highly appreciated cryptocurrency, businesses, real estate, limited partnerships, carried interest, captive insurance, and you can defer the tax using a trust. Um, the way we do it, we can talk about here in a minute, but the key thing is you got to figure out a way to exit your asset and not get hit with the tax because it's not just about cash flow, David. It's about tax flow, and the government has a big, big debt to pay, and they're looking for David and Brett and everyone else listening to us to pay for that debt, but they also give us incentives to not have to pay tax right away. And that's by using stuff like the deferred sales trust. Holy cow. Okay. Awesome, man. So yeah, you just named a bunch of different ways that we can use. Uh, but you just mentioned another one at the end there, the deferred sales trust. Am I saying that right? Is it a deferred tax trust or deferred sales trust? What's the uh, proper deferred way? Deferred sales trust is the proper way, but a delayed sales trust or delayed tax trust is another way to think about it. You're delaying the tax, but the official name is a deferred sales trust. Not to be confused with the Delaware Statutory Trust, which is another DST that most people, it's just a part of the 1031 family. I call it the Hollywood video next to the old 1031 blockbuster, where you're just giving up all control to a third party corporation typically that have class A non value add deals typically. And there's seven to 10 year holds, huge fees, and no liquidity, no diversification. Whereas ours, the Netflix version, you can literally you can put it into the bank. You can put it into hard money lending that have liquid funds. You can put it into securities. The whole idea though is to sell high and buy low, which is what our, our parents taught us to do, David. They didn't teach us to sell high and buy higher 180 days later. Properties that we know don't make it make a lot of sense, um, um, but we feel forced to because of the tax. And so that's where we come in and we we provide a, a better way and it's a, it's a, a way to, to help you create and preserve more wealth. All right, so when you mentioned that, um... Okay. Interesting. So you have to have a liquidity event to use one of these. Is that the case for the most Correct. part? And, and what, what would be the ideal person that would want to use this? I mean, does anybody, can anybody use this? Shouldn't anyone use this? Is there, is there certain people that this might not work for or isn't ideal? 
Yeah, so who, who's a deferred sales trust work for? Anyone who has a million dollar net proceeds and a million dollar gain on any single asset that they're trading or exiting it from, okay? Now, if you have two at 500 each, you can also combine those two to scale and make it make sense. We found it make, it's a 10 out of 10 every time, it, it, no matter what state you're in, no matter where you're at. If you have a million dollar net proceeds, a million dollar gain, it's an absolute home run. Um, it works for LPs, GPs. It works for, you know, again, primary homes, businesses, cryptocurrency. You can save a failed 1031 exchange, investment property, of course, artwork, collectibles, NFTs. Remember that Blockbuster 1031 only works for investment real estate, right? We work for all asset types. Mm, okay. Deferred sales trust. Okay. So you have to have a million dollar net liquidity event and that's got to be a gain as that's net not gross you're saying yeah net and net a million dollar gain and a million dollar net proceeds okay got it okay interesting what is the cost of setting like this up about 1.5 percent on the first million so let's just say it's a million dollars it's about fifteen thousand one one-time fee then the ongoing my role as a trustee and the financial advisors we work with it's about one and a half percent ongoing up to 2%, just depending on where and how the funds are invested. This is why we like to have the gain, David, to be big enough to offset and get a good return on your investment. The more important question to ask is, well, how do I make this thing an investment and not an expense? Because some people look at that and they go, oh, that seems like it's kind of ongoing, it's expensive. Well, yeah, maybe. You know, if your tax is, you know, three or $400,000 and it's the government's money anyways, and you're able to defer that earned wealth on that, well, then maybe it's a really good deal. You can pay that tax or you can defer and earn interest on it. Our typical paybacks are somewhere around 8% net of the fees, net of the 1.5% to 2% per year over any 10-year period of time. That's net of the recurring fees. And so the rules, the idea is the rule of 72. If we can use the government's money along with our money and we can net 8% net of fees over a 10-year period, well, in nine years, you double that money. And, and now you can keep it going for as long as you want. You can go for another 10 years. You can pass it to kids, keep it going. And, and again, the idea is just to keep living off the interest. You'll pay tax as you receive some payments back, right? That's normal. Uh, but it's kind of like an IRA. It's kind of like a 401k. But the best thing is you can sell high and buy low. And in fact, the reason I started this company, David, was because in 2008, the marketplace fell apart. And I was at Marcus and Millichap buying and selling and, and helping my clients uh, with multifamily properties. And the market completely fell apart. And we saw clients, friends, and family lose half or lose everything over the next three years. And part of what we identified was the 1031 exchange was the enemy because uh, they were overpaying for properties so they knew they didn't want to buy. But because of the tax and they felt they had no other way, they were going to buy it. And so they got hammered. And so uh, we learned that the deferred sales trust could have been that solution. And that began the journey of educating people. And now this is all we do. We coach, train, and close deals every day. Interesting. So what if somebody, okay, so you had mentioned that you guys, so you're investing these funds for people, but you you also said that there's like a liquidity there. So how does that work? Like, you know, what if somebody doesn't want you guys to invest their funds? They just want you to hold them in trust and then they then take those funds and then invest them, you know, into their own real estate or crypto or whatever. And they don't need a, a, an advisor essentially. That's the best part, right? Because we're not, you know, by nature, I grew up in the real estate business with, with, with rentals and development and then brokerage. So that's where we made, and my clients have made all of our wealth. And if it wasn't for what I'm about to tell you right here, I wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't for what you just said, I wouldn't be here. Like, because none of our clients and no entrepreneurs and mostly crypto millionaires, they don't want to just give it up to some third party financial advisor and just run it. So the first thing to understand is the funds never move without your approval or your signature. Okay, so you you must approve of all of the investments, okay? Number two, um, the entrepreneurial freedom that this provides. And in fact, in 2006, the reason I started this company was for what I called the Monday morning quarterback deal for the Deferred Sales Trust. It's one of the most prolific deals in the history of the Deferred Sales Trust. And if you're a football fan, maybe you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan, right? You're out of Missouri. Um, uh, you know, if you can play back with Mahomes, you know, the next day, he, you, you know, he could throw 10 touchdowns, right? Versus throwing six. Well, this is what this guy did. He sold in 2006 at the peak, and he's looking around. This guy's actually out of Minnesota, across the street from the Minnesota Vikings Stadium. He's looking with his 1031 binoculars. He's like, these deals make zero sense. He had a sense that something was going to happen. He had no idea it was going to be 2008, but he's like, I am not going to buy something right now. I'm either going to pay the tax or I'm going to take a 
shift here, and I'm gonna do this deferred sales trust. So he sells the $20 million asset, he places the funds into the trust, puts it into liquid investment grade securities, the stocks, bonds, mutual funds, stuff that wasn't subject to the big crash. He hedged and protected, had it very conservative stuff, but he kept this powder dry, right, with extra millions of dollars, right, that he would have paid of tax. So he's like, if I can keep it just, just breaking even, I'll be okay. Five years later, the, the, the bank calls him back, who he had sold the property and had did a loan for the new buyer. They said, hey, we're just calling you. You know that property you sold five years ago to that crazy 1031 California buyer? And he said, yeah. He goes, well, we just foreclosed on him and we're just calling because we're curious. Do you, do you want to buy it back from us? He goes, well, maybe. What's the price? And they said, well, about 60 cents less than what, or 60, 60, uh, 60, uh, 60 cents on the dollar from what you sold it for, 40% less. He goes, yeah, give me a few days. So he was able to reallocate the funds that were in the trust to a brand new LLC, which he's the owner operator of in partnership with the trust and he bought back the property at 60 cents on the dollar okay so he sold high david and he bought low and my brain at this point exploded because i'm going no no we're 1031 exchange you can't do that right you know go ahead. this is not a 1031 exchange wait, wait, wait you can't sell high and buy low and still defer the tax yeah you can this is how you can do it this is exactly what you can do and so that began the journey of wow if this is actually real this will change everything for every investor who's in real estate and in cryptocurrency and business crypto wasn't around at that point right but it'll change everything. And so that's, 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 that's the deferred sales trust that literally gives you the ability to do that. Um, on, and we do it every single day with clients. Awesome. Awesome. So, so, so the, 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 the money that's in the account though, is you had mentioned dry powder, but you also said like it's in, it was in, you know, stocks and bonds. So you guys are investing the cash or is there any reason that somebody would just want cash in their account? I guess not. Can. I had clients during, the, again, the funds will never be invested without your approval. Let's say it's your deal, David, but I'll just give a client. I had a couple of clients during COVID-19. They didn't want to be in real estate and they didn't want to be in the stock market. So we sat in cash for months. Mm. So there's no, there's no like, you know, 45 days to get into something or, or you know, invest something. But what the goal is, is to return that money to you plus a rate of return. It's a promissory you note. Know, the, the whole, the way this thing works, by the way, is you loan the funds to the trust in exchange for the trust to pay you back over time. It's based upon IRC 453, where if David owns a $10 million apartment complex in St. Louis, Missouri, and he has a zero basis, he's owned it for 27 and a half years, and he has no debt, he could carry paper for a brand new buyer. He could become the lender, right? And the buyer could put a million dollars down. You could carry paper for nine and you're in a deferral state on that nine. The difference is that we say, hey, David, don't finance that buyer. Let him go get you know money that's pretty cheap, you know, relatively speaking, for interest rates and let him come with cash at the close, closing table. Who cares how he gets it? But ask him to cooperate with the trust. And David, you will finance the trust 100% and sell the asset to the trust first. And then the trust will immediately sell it to the cash buyer second. And it's in that that framework, the smoke clears, the buyer takes title, he's gone, and you're left with a promissory note, and you are the lender, and so you haven't taken any actual or constructive receipt of the cash, and therefore you're in a deferral state, okay? Now, it's at that you point- You sell it that, to the trust at zero dollars? Uh, you sell it for $10 million, but you receive a zero down payment. You carry back 100% financing. Now, you're welcome to take whatever cash. You can do 90% or 80% and just pay tax on what you receive. But if you want to basically do a zero tax event at that point, by the way, it's not unlike what a 1031 does as well. You could send all of the funds, all of the 10 million, take no actual receipt of those funds to a qualified intermediary. The funds sit there for those time period, and then it gets moved over into another deal. Right, so it's mm -hmm. the same concept, except it's just kind of like a uh, a long term four hundred one k or long term IRA or a long term ten thirty one. However, it's also entrepreneurial. You can use the funds for fix and flip, for business sales. Uh, for a t we had a, a cryptocurrency seller, she had fifty thousand of Bitcoin went to fifty million. She exited five million when Bitcoin was at fifty four thousand a coin, and she put four million into a tech startup. We had another Ethereum client sold uh, Ethereum when Ethereum hit 13 uh, for them. They bought Ethereum at 100,000 and they went to 13 and a half million. They exited 5 million and another two and a half million. And part of what they want to do is buy some Airbnb rentals. Now, right now they're in the stock market, just kind of keeping their powder dry. And luckily they did a lot of that because Ethereum kind of dropped in half again. And so these are the things that we can do. It works and it, it just depends on what you want, right? And we design it around those things. There's some guidelines. We can't put it into a primary home. Right. Any cash you take will be taxable and that's OK. People pay tax all the time. But the remainder, if you're keeping it in this deferral state, remains in a deferred state. Interesting. What about um, 
what about future events, right? So let's say I have an apartment building that I sell and there's a million dollar gain on it. And I want to come to you guys um, and set one of these up. And then, you know, we take that money and we defer it and we do all the things that you mentioned, which is awesome. I love that. Very cool, by the way. Very cool. I actually just learned about this about two weeks ago. So this is really cool that I'm getting the deep dive on it because that was just like five minutes. This is really great to like kind of get the deep dive on it. Uh, but what happens if, you know, three years goes by, for example, in this scenario, and I have another, you know, 500000 or another, maybe even less, maybe a $200,000 event. Am I able to roll that into the trust as well? Or how does that work? Absolutely. So can the deferred sales trust work for multiple investments? The answer is yes. At different times, the answer is yes. You form one trust and you have multiple promissory notes. I'll give you an example. One of our clients in Phoenix, Arizona, two GPs on a $20 million asset. Actually, the first one was in Vegas. They sold the multifamily property for about 20 million. And then just their GP interest went into the trust. The rest of their LPs just paid their tax. Then they sold their second deal in Phoenix a couple months later. That was a $16 million deal. And the same thing, their GP interest rolls into the trust as their second promissory note. Then they sold their third one and they're, and they're selling their fourth one just closed on Monday. It, collectively, it's about 90 million now. Of, of the total asset sales prices. Now they just put their GP interest in there and each time they get promissory notes, one trust for each of the partners, multiple promissory notes. So the answer is yes. Okay, so when you pull money out though, you're not pulling it out. I mean, it, it's a distribution at that point. Like let's say that you wanted to take some money out of there, right? To use it, to like buy your groceries or whatever it is, buy that boat or that airplane or that car or that RV. When you pull it out, are you borrowing from it? Or are you actually taking it out and having the taxable event at that point? You're taking it out and having the tax appointment event at that point. So when is it, when is the deferred sales trust taxable? It's taxable when you're basically using it for personal use or personal property, right? Now, if it's an investment property, you can you can do the partnership LLC, what we talked about, and that's tax deferred. But yeah, but if you're in groceries or regular, you know, regular primary home investments or you know, it, that's all going to be taxable per se. You can okay, I got but you. investment real estate—that's the thing, right? So that's what we always ask the pe our clients: say, well, what, what are we going to do with the money anyways? Well, I was just going to invest it anyways. Okay, what were you going to do? Well, I was going to go build with it. I was going to do some fix and flips. I was going to go buy some crypto. I was going to go put it in the stock market. I was going to do some hard money lending. I was just going to stick it in the bank. Okay. Well, well do you want to pay the 30 to 50% in capital gains tax and depreciation or capital? Or would you like to defer that? Well, I'd like to defer it. Of course you would, right? So that's why our deal has got to be big enough to offset and make sense of the ROI. Man, that is awesome. Holy cow. This has been an awesome, awesome show, Brett. Brett, how can people connect with you if they want to learn more about this? Um, again, guys, you need to have a seven figure taxable event to set this up. That's basically the minimum. So there's a lot of people that are just getting started that this isn't going to apply to, but I'm glad you're hearing this and I'm glad you're learning about this because you can circle back to this episode once you grow your portfolio up and you start having these taxable events. And there's, of course, people that are listening that are you know probably having this issue already. So this is great. So Brett, how can people connect with you? Where do they learn more? I know you have your own podcast, Capital Gains Tax Solutions Podcast, but where's the best place for them to go? You have a website or a social or an email or what do you suggest? Yeah, so search Capital Gains Tax Solutions on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. Check out the new book, uh, Building a Tax Deferred Extra Strategy. And it's it's we call it the proven playbook for unlocking your ideal wealth plan when selling assets of any kind for yourself or your clients. We have some really smart people, David. They say to get in their smart room with smarter people. We have people like Kevin Harrington from Shark Tanks in the book. People like Joe Fairless, Dan Hanford, uh, Buck Joffrey, Kevin Bupp. Uh, David Young, these really, really, uh, Brian Burke. So these are a lot of multifamily syndicators are in the book too. So I'm a cash flow real estate yeah, kid, right? Grew up loving multifamily investments, value add deals, ground up development. And so we buy, syndicate, you know, broker, all of the above, but we, we niche focus on this deferred sales trust to help all of our clients, friends and family, um, you know, deferred tax grow wealth. So yeah, go to capitalgainstaxsolutions.com. Awesome, man, this is cool. Do you guys... So it, I would imagine that there's CPAs and advisors for the, the actual um, investing, you got financial planners and advisors. Is that all held, you know, under one roof or is there multiple parts that are involved? And you know what I'm saying? Like, what's the, let's say that I wanted to, you know, set one of these up. Would I be working with you or I would be working with somebody that you work with or how does that process work? Great question. So we work with strategic alliances across the country. So who, who what are the roles for the deferred sales trust? So there's there's a couple roles. The first role or one of the roles is, is a trustee and that's our role, capital gains tax, which is a third party unrelated trustee. 
The second role would be the tax attorney. Uh, he's one of my business partners, uh, creator of the structure. He's a CPA and a tax attorney, has a law firm, and they do all the legal work. They're also the ones who've survived all of the audits with the clients and, and provide lifetime audit defense, 26-year track record, thousands of closes, billions under management. So that's all there. Um, and then the third role is a, is a third-party financial advisor. We work with advisors across the country to help uh, do that. And also, we're not under one roof, and it necessarily for tax deferral because each of us can't be one another, but also it's good for transparency and accountability for everything that we're doing. And then we have a third party, uh, another third party tax preparer who files a tax return on behalf of the trust. You keep your own CPA, you file your own tax return the same way think the same way you would have. You also have your own 1099 that you get based upon what you receive in the given year. You just report that. So we're not replacing your CPA, your team. We're just in addition for the, for the major exits. And then we work alongside to keep that tax deferral and the business trust going. So hopefully that answers your question, David. It did. Multiple ways and multiple angles, all of it. You nailed it. Wow. That's amazing. Brett, thank you so much for coming on and talking about um, you know, how we can reduce our capital gains, defer the tax capital gains, and essentially you know, mitigate them completely in some scenarios, at least in the short term. What you got? Can I throw a bonus in there too? Please, so um, for any ultra high net worth clients listening to this, uh, we did a deal out of Colorado. It was a $5 million exit for a multifamily owner. Now, their biggest challenge wasn't just capital gains tax, because that's what we've been talking about mostly here today. And we call that the tiger by the tail, which is very important. Again, it's 25 to 50%. Their challenge was the elephant in the room. They're worth $25 million, and they had all of it inside of their taxable estate. So it's something called an estate tax or death tax. So it basically states that, David, if you're married, you get about $22 million exempt. And if you're single, about $12 million exempt, although those are set to cut in half in 2025. Anything above and beyond that's going to be hit with a 40% debt tax it has nothing to do with a 1031 or a stepped up basis. It doesn't do anything for that. It's your total estate. So this particular client, based upon some of the rough numbers, we rough we, we estimated they're going to be worth 50 or 60 million by the time they pass, given their age and everything else. And so their challenge was all 25 millions inside the taxable estate. So as they exited their first $5 million asset, their number one reason they use of the deferred sales trust was not just the capital gains tax. They eliminated the estate tax in one day, in one transaction, without buying life insurance, without doing any gifting, without giving it all the way to charity. And we believe that's honestly, for the ultra high net worth, like an amazing thing that most people just don't know about, but it has to happen at the exit. It can't just be, oh, I just want to move stuff over here. No, no, no. It has to be a third party buyer, fair market value. It's like the fourth quarter, 10 seconds to go. We've got to get it all set up prior to, by the way. So if you are listening to this, we work at a no cost, no obligation basis. You need to get with us early to get everything set up. If your deal doesn't close, we don't charge you anything. But if it does close and you use the trust, then we charge you. So just get with us early so we can make sure to get everything set up properly. I love it. Brett, this has been amazing, guys. Check out Brett Schwartz. Connect with him directly. Go to YouTube, all the socials, type in Capital Gains Tax Solutions, and you can connect with him. You can go to his site. You can learn more. This has been an awesome podcast, Brett. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for educating me and my audience on how cool these, and I'm going to say this, hopefully I say this right, Deferred Sales Trust. Is that right? Awesome. Got it. How cool the Deferred Sales Trust is and how amazing it can be to help build your wealth and preserve it at the same time simultaneously. It's amazing. All right, guys, thanks for listening. Don't forget, you make your money when you buy, you get paid when you sell. So get out there, find some deals. And with that, sign it off. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. All right, how'd I do? Good. I think you're still recording on your end. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Yeah, you did good, man. That was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on.